And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us, str coming to us straight from um, better, time better time zones. <laughs> Alle allegedly more reasonable ones yeah uh, I don't know about that <laughs> and creator of the upcoming superhero RPG epic the one and only Joel Velazquez how are you doing today man or tonight doing... <laughs> I'm doing great tonight how about you I'm good um I am groaning about the fact that apparently another winter storm is going to be hit is going to be hitting my area at the mm. end of the week, but um, I'm in the Midwest where Mother Nature is on drugs. Oh, that's very true. I I used to live in Iowa uh, almost a decade ago at this point. Yeah, and I uh, I used to have to drive through like blizzards uh, during the winter time. And I remember one time my mom got mad at me because uh, she I didn't pick her up from the airport at time at the uh, on time and. Like it was a full whiteout, and I just looked at her and said, "Okay, sure, no, that's fair. That's fully fair." <laughs> oh. oh, wait, she got she got mad at you because you because you were late during a what during a complete when it was when there was a complete whiteout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a full on blizzard, uh, and I had to drive from Ames to Des Moines to to pick her up, and she was just like, "Well, I figured you would be here on time," and I said. Yeah, well, the, the winter didn't want me to be here on time, Mom. I don't know what you want me to do. Yeah, this is this is why you this is why you always have to be aware of the difference between actual time and restaurant time. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> you know the whole it'll be five minutes for a table, then you're waiting twenty five minutes. Mm-hmm. Of course. Uh, and. With now, with that in mind, it's mm -hmm. a bit of a tradition around here to go into the humble beginnings, the origin story. <laughs> How fitting! So, so, yes, walk walk <laughs> me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Right. Um. So, um, a couple years back, I'd always been a nerd, and I always loved uh, all things like fantasy. Um. And a couple years back, you know, kind of. A lot of other people's uh, similar stories. I uh, heard about um, that D and D was becoming like a very popular thing. I never really uh, thought about getting into it, just because I um, I didn't really have a whole lot of people around that were interested in that. And honestly, at that time, um, it seemed too nerdy even for me. Um, and that was just me lying to myself because it was just the perfect right amount of nerdiness for me. But um, Eventually, uh, I started the weirdest thing, and this is going to seem stupid, but the thing that kind of overly, uh, overall pushed. Sorry, my mic cut out. Um, the thing that kind of pushed me into um, into really looking into D and D was I was. Uh, hang out with my buddy Trey, and he I found I saw an article online that that said that Vin Diesel played D and D. And I looked at him and I said, that's crazy. Vin Diesel? Like, what? I didn't think he would play D&D. &D. Like, he doesn't seem like a nerd to me. And he looked at me and he said, are you kidding me? He plays, he stars in movies about cars that defy the laws of physics. That man absolutely is a nerd. It does not surprise me. And I thought about it, I was like, huh. So just uh, knowing, hearing about that and then reading about other celebrities that were getting into D&D, &D, and doing it publicly, I was like, well, maybe I should take a look at this. Maybe it really isn't as nerdy as I thought. And uh, I looked into the fourth edition of D&D &D, um, because no one told me um, the quote-unquote right or wrong versions. And so I looked into the fourth edition because I found a PDF online. And I started looking into it, and I tried to find people to play. And the first time I tried to get someone to play fourth edition to, uh, with me, it was one of my coworkers. And he said, gross, don't play that crap. You need to play 3.5 edition. Um, and yeah, from there, it was just uh, a, a me bouncing around trying to find people to, to play with. 
until years later, uh, I got fed up with trying to find a group and just decided to make a group uh, here in my uh, where I'm currently at a couple years ago, um, where I started DMing and I've been there uh, wonderful uh, and humble forever DM uh, ever since. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as the whole Vin Diesel thing, allow me to raise you one with <laughs> yeah. with one word, Riddick. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's a good. That's also a good point. Yeah, when you look at Vin Diesel's stuff, like it, it's not too hard to realize that the the man has has always kind of had a, a taste for the nerdy, and I don't know why. Uh, I at, at that time I just didn't realize. I didn't make that connection. I didn't see through the truth. I don't think anybody would have seen the idea of hi- of him of him trying <laughs> to play Bloodshot, even though that the movie sucked. But just the just the fact that a that a character like Bloodshot, who is who is from Valiant, not Marvel or DC. Some people were think some people were thinking that Bloodshot was a DC character, and I'm like, get mm. your fucking facts straight, people. <laughs> he's from Va- he's from Valiant. Mm-hmm. Um, the same the company that was made by Jim Shooter, the guy who. Pretty, who pretty much spearheaded the golden age of the X Men? Oh yeah, yeah. Also got himself screwed over a bunch of times, but that's a whole other story. Of course. <laughs> but the I think what I find what I what I do find interesting in regard mm-hmm. to that is, and spe- especially speak especially speaking of that of that kind of thing is dip. Were you? Is um when it comes to the creation of Epic, that is a superhero based game. Yeah. Um So this is this question is twofold. On one yeah. hand, what was your first introduction to the idea of doing supers in a tabletop form and what was your introduction to just superheroes as far as as far as the concept, whether it be whether it be through comics or something else? Sure. Um well <clears throat> To, I could start with the with the second one that uh, when I was younger, um, I remember uh, very fondly going to. Uh, I, I lived in in Puerto Rico at the time with uh, with my mom and my grandma, and uh, my grandma and I would go to um, the mall like a couple towns over where there was a small comic book shop. I don't actually even think it's still there anymore, uh, but hopefully it is because you know that place is great. Um, but uh, she and I would go there, and I would just. Uh, go through the the issues and just look at the the covers and just be wowed by um you know all the obviously like these very very fascinating and these powerful looking characters uh and to that point of of specifically of power um i think the first couple of comics i owned were actually uh, incredible hulk comics um and i don't know what it was about it that i was just so drawn to it and i loved the the story of bruce banner um <clears throat> like having that duality of, of struggling with the Hulk, even as like an eight year old, which is when, when this would have happened like a seven or eight year old. But I, I don't know. I just loved, uh, I loved uh, reading comics. I always had a weird, like I was just naturally drawn to them. Um, and then as the years went by, I loved like watching superhero cartoons. Uh, like growing up, like I was a huge fan of teen Titans. I was a huge fan of Spider-Man. Uh, I was a huge fan of like Justice League, all these things, and um, Part of me wants to be a smart ass and say which Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the time, I grew up with the uh, like the '90s uh, era Spider Man, where it had that like kind of like punk rock intro. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That low era, I, uh, I unfortunately didn't get a chance to watch like the original animated series, where obviously the best memes come from online. Um, much, until much later, but, but yeah, I I grew up with, with uh, watching those, and uh, there weren't a lot of comics uh, around me to be able to like pick up and read those. My brothers didn't really read comics either, um, so I I didn't get those secondhand from them like I did everything else, like I did with video games, for example, which is where my passion love for them comes from. But um, but it wasn't until uh, I think sometime in like late middle school early high school i started getting really really into superheroes again and you know i loved the toby Maguire spider-man movies um i <clears throat> loved the uh all these um the the 
even though they were they were kind of like we look at them now and they we they seem crappy. I did enjoy like the Hulk movies like with Eric Bana, um, <clears throat> or the the one movie with Eric Bana. Um, I, you know, I I remember those uh, fondly, and um, it it reignited that love I had for for superheroes. And while it, it's sad to say that my my love for the Hulk has kind of dwindled a little bit, not in in the sense that I I don't like the Hulk anymore. I do, um, but he's not my favorite anymore. Like my my top three are uh, Captain America, Spider Man, and the Flash. So um, it would. I yeah. think it sounds like it'd be fair to say that even when it comes to comics that you've read over the years, you're more of a Marvel guy than a DC guy. I am more of a Marvel guy, but I. I <laughs> It's funny because I'm one of those that doesn't really like to pick sides because I love what each of them try to do and what the, each of them have accomplished over the years. And I, I, I love them both equally. They're, they're both my favorites. But, but yes, I do tend to steer on the side of Marvel a lot, especially when it comes to uh, modern media. Um, although there have been a lot of like animated DC stuff that I just have to respect because DC animated stuff is just absolutely phenomenal most of the time. So, um, but yes, I do veer on that side of loving Marvel, and I and Captain America has been my favorite superhero for for years and years. Um, I I've always resonated with the the way he does things. I absolutely despise what they did with him in the uh, the Secret Empire arc. How dare you ruin my my favorite my favorite boy? Um, but. To go back to your to your first question as to why uh, why superhero themed uh, RPGs, um, it, it was probably almost a year ago now that um, I had been you know I've been running campaigns with my my at home group and I had been um, watching like live play things on my free time and uh, while well, I just like draw my on my home computer or I'll just be gaming or whatever and. Um, I forgot. I think it was uh, I was watching probably like Young Justice, where I I kept I had an itch to play a game like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, but you know with superhero themes. So I looked up to see what what ones were out there, and I managed to find uh, quite a few. There are a few out there, and it would be uh, you know it would be. Uh, rude to to not you know at least mention them, but um, I I did find a couple out there and I I looked into them I looked into how they operated what the rules were um, how I can get my hands on on the rule books and whatnot and you know there were obvious suggestions out there um, to to name a few there were like you know uh, Mass the Next Generation there was Mutants and Masterminds or Champions there um, and whatnot and eventually I um, I I stumbled upon. Uh, the multiverse, uh, the Marvel's multiverse one that's coming out. Yeah, and the and yeah, I think we're. I think this is round number five when it comes to Marvel TTRPGs. Yeah, <laughs> um, I looked into that. And I was like, okay, I like the. You know, it seems like it's it's fairly new, so it's not any like archaic new um, uh, archaic rule set. Um, it's it's set for more modern um, TTRPG uh, audience, so. You know, maybe it's worth looking into. And I picked up the uh, like the playtest manual and I looked through it. And again, I, I I have to pay respects to what's out there because you know, obviously they're successful and they work for people. Um, I, but I looked at it and it just didn't work for me. I looked at it and I saw it was very very focused on like number crunching and it seemed to have the same flaw I find in a lot of Marvel games, which is uh, and this leads to video games as well, which is that Marvel likes it when you play their characters. They don't like it when you have your idea of a character in that world. You know what's funny about that? The first... Now, as I, as I mentioned, Mar Marvel has had an interesting relationship with tabletop games yeah. um, going all the way back to the 70s. Mm -hmm. The original version of Mar of the Mar of Marvel superheroes, a.k.a. Um, Marvel Phase Rip, the <clears throat> one, the one, the run that was done by TSR, which still has fan support to this day, um, did not. The original book did not have character creation rules. <laughs> the, it, it 
and <laughs> it was they didn't put they didn't put that in until the advanced book came came out a few months. L- I think it was I think it was either a few months or a year later. I'd have to double check. Point mm-hmm. is, there would be a bit of time, and this was not the last time this kind of thing would happen. This is the reason why TSR's run with Indiana Jones is mocked because they assumed you'd want to play as the cast from the movies, which right is a very bad is a very bad mistake. Yeah, um, and yeah, the th- something I will. The 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 sad thing is the closest is that um I can understand why I can understand why um Marvel would want people to play as their play as their characters but and this is this is a problem I see I see quite a bit when people are getting into RPGs mm-hmm. playing it playing as an established care playing as an established character as your PC mm. is kind of missing the point yes um. Uh, I will admit, when it comes to superheroes and video games, most of, um, most of most of them are gonna are gonna be having are gonna be having you playing as a, as established characters. Um, although one that although one that I admit I have a bit of a soft spot for is um, Freedom Force, as well as okay. City of Heroes. City of Heroes is the benchmark when it comes to um, that kind of customization. Hmm. Uh, even even after all these years, it ha- nobody's been, nobody's been able to hit that throne, um, right? But I'd say maybe you maybe you had the same maybe you had the same issue. But another issue that can really crop up with superhero games and universalist games because they're like ra- like a razor wire thi- um, thin line between each other is choice paralysis. Mm, yeah. Because let's say, let's say that somebody wants to do their their XP their um XP of let's go with let's go with someone a little bit let's go with someone a little bit less obvious let's go with say say they say they want they want they want to claim that they want that they want to do something a la Zat- a la Zatanna right uh. I fig I figured going with a bigger name would make this a little too obvious, so I'm going. So I'm going. <laughs> so I'm going with my favorite spellcaster in DC. Hands down. But so first off, um, the way a lot of games use magic is is basically using it as a glorified wild card, which has its own problems. Right. Like you put points in magic, you can use the you can use those to replicate any any other power. Well, now you've now you've du- you've doubled down on that problem, mm. um, <laughs> but a lot in a lot of cases, I, you you end up with two extremes. You either have superhero games that try to use a class system, which, in my opinion, is can, can um, unless you're if you're doing if you're doing it in say D and D style classes, then pe- then um you might want you might want to rethink that. Or you have the case of okay, you have this many character points. Spend them how you like, and then they push you. They push you into the deep end of the pool and just tell you swim. Damn it! Right. <laughs> Even games I like are um are not immune to this. Yeah. I I love cha- I love the hero system. I like champions. It is one of the big offenders with this. Um, <laughs> Masks is the op- is the opposite is the opposite end of the spectrum due to the fate system, but I have problems with the fate system, namely not doing a good job explaining what makes a good or bad aspect. Mm-hmm. And if if a good chunk of your design is going to be built around aspects, I think it's warranted to explain what it what is a good or bad um, example. Right. Um. And. The, and in the ki- in I will I will admit that some of the super stuff with Savage Worlds fit, um fits a nice fits a nice medium but that has but that's also a universalist game and thus you're going to have to deal with the um p- the choice paralysis of picking from a bunch of powers. Right. Now that that is all a bit of a bit of setup for my next question which is mm-hmm. how you how you're going to be addressing the power is the power issue because you've no doubt seen those big ass power lists in games just as much as I have. 
Yes, yes. And it, it's, it's true. It is, uh, like you said, it's choice paralysis. Like, you look at that and you just go, okay, well, what do, what do I want to make? Uh, what do I do? Um, and especially if they if they don't give you a nice clear cut um, image of like, or maybe even just a good example of maybe a character you want to throw together um, to get you started. <clears throat> That's one of the things I think I respect about like the uh, way D and D handles like uh, if you if you feel that uh, like I have no idea what I'm doing, like you can just use one of the uh, pre created characters. You make Brain uh, Bruiner, like just play Bruiner. You know uh, what I mean? Like they got that ready to go. There is there uh, is one there is one um, underlying problem when it comes to just pick just picking a um, a created character. Mm hmm. And that is okay. You've got your start. You've got your start. You've gone through your first session, and you've gotten your you've gotten experience. Mm -hmm. oh, so what next? <laughs> right. Oh um, yeah. I'm truth. Truth be told, one of my one of my favorite instances of of how pre gens were handled, oddly enough, is um, mutants and masterminds third edition. Okay. Because they have the basic pregens in the front, but towards the back, there's a kind of, there's a kind, there's a kind of choose your own adventure st style of style of doing pregens that allow for a bit more allow for a bit more flexibility. Mm -hmm. So and they're all bit and they're all based on theme. Like there's like when it comes to the caster, there's there's different subtypes for different types of quote unquote magic systems. Yeah. Oh. But it's what from what I saw with the with the document that you have it looks like you have like you are doing a class system but not exact but not exactly. Yeah, so the way that I'm I've set up Epic is there are I think on the uh, the Kickstarter it says uh, twenty uh, twenty I actually have twenty one uh, and I'm still playing around with one of them to see if I want to make a twenty second but um, I have uh, types are more or less like archetypes which are uh, power expressions more or less so um, there are a bunch of ones that range from like elemental types to uh, to more like tech focused ones to weapon focused ones and um, <clears throat> I, I could go down the whole list of them but um, but the idea behind them is it is supposed to feel it's supposed to be a class in a way of like this is a general vibe of what this type is like so when you go into playing uh when you choose this type and when you go into playing this type that there are a there are sets of uh powers that are available to you as you evolve but you're not restricted to a very linear growth that's one of the, uh, I, I initially um my rough draft of this did have a very linear thing where like at you know, at first level, you get this. At third level, you get this. At fifth level, you get this. And I looked at that, and I, when I was uh, when I was looking it over, and I had a Q and A um, where uh, someone was asking me like how the, the types work and how you could create certain characters. I looked at my, what I was doing, and I thought that's boring. Like that doesn't really a that doesn't really. Uh, give itself to the spirit of what I want to do, which is allowing the create uh, the the player the creativity to create their ideal idealized uh, character. Um, but also having that very linear, rigid structure um, is it's very predictable. It's kind of like how in d and d, like if you if you're playing a uh, a circle, uh, or no, I'm not even going to say it, give that. That's that's even too broad. Um, but if you're playing like a monk, let's just say you're playing a monk, um, you're looking at all the things that are available for your monk as you level up, and you know at this level you're going to get uh, the... I forget what it's called, but the ability where you catch arrows in midair. And if you play like Way of the Shadows, then uh, you have like these abilities. Or if you're uh, way of the elemental, then you have these abilities at this given level. And while that may work for D&D, &D, uh, because people can just look past that, I didn't like that structure for Epic, because I felt that that was too, too rigid for what the types are supposed to be. The idea behind them is that, again, they're, they're power expressions. So you, in each type, you have a list of abilities. There's 50 in total. Um, they're all divided by tiers. 
uh, and the idea is as you level, you essentially get uh, ability slots that uh, when you level up, you gain a new slot and you can choose a power from uh, the tier that you have a slot for and then choose from the list available for your type. You take that onto yourself uh, and the the beauty of that is you don't have you're not you're likely not going to have the same character repeat themselves um, every time. So you're not going to have three uh, pyros that are exactly the same a lot of the times. They're going to have different abilities. They're going to function differently, which is true for actual like comic book superheroes. The Human Torch, uh, Ghost Rider, and Fire they they function very differently uh, across their different mediums and across their stories. They have different abilities. And it would be, uh, it would honestly just be, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, <laughs> it would be dishonest to say that, like, just because they all have fire powers, that they are, they, they should have all the same abilities. So that's why I came up with the, the, ability slots in the tier system or i call it really the power pools for right now i'm working on the title but uh, or that name but the idea is that you have a list of abilities that are available to your type um that you chose um as, and as you grow you can choose new abilities for yourself as your your character grows and, and acquires new powers and new expressions for their power yeah, yeah. now i'm getting i'm when it came to that q and I'm guessing this got brought up. Um, e even though you're using, ar even though you're using archetypes or po or power sets or what have you, mm -hmm. um, would it be fair of me to say that this isn't a all worlds lead to ro lead to Rome thing? But you and it is possible to mi to mix around when it comes to it. Essentially, mul essentially, this is the multi class question. Sure. Um, I haven't fully fleshed out uh, necessarily. Like, I haven't written a a section or a rule section about it. But I, I did play. I've been playing with that idea for the last uh, like month or so. Um, of especially with this newer format of like the power or ability pools. That yeah, you can absolutely mix and uh, I don't want to say mix and match, but yeah, you can multi class to gain uh, like different abilities that could probably actually maybe even cross over and enhance your your other powers from other types um it's I, it's hard for me to give a, a specific example right now but you know somebody who is of the uh like the geotype which are like uh terramancers geomancers and things like that, or geokinetics uh could probably uh multi-class into i don't know whatever they want if they want to multi-class into like a gunner where they now specialize in firearms and they have abilities uh, where they can uh, manipulate or, uh, their their bullets or even um, perform like trick shots, but they manipulate the terrain so that it's more optimal for them. You know what I mean? So it's it's possible um, now that multi-classing can actually serve a purpose um, if that is the direction that you want to go in. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm g because of the way the because I did see the mock-up character sheet on the Kickstarter page, yes. and given the tier system that you ha that you have here, mm -hmm. um, I am guessing that each that the tier the tiered abilities are kind are more are more akin to a tech tree or rather tech pyramid in terms of what in terms of what you get out of it, and you're not going to be getting the whole tree. You're not going to be getting the whole tree across across all five tiers. Um, I'm trying to understand what you mean. Uh, it. Uh, I'm mm. referring to how each tier has a set of has a set of um abilities that you can that you can access. Right. And I'm guessing. I'm. I'm guessing that it's not going to be an all roads lead to lead to Rome situation. Right. Um. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, <laughs> trying to make sure I, I, um, if it helps, it, if, if it helps, I'm reminded of a skill tree that you'd see in, say, Diablo. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so, it's, 
it's definitely not like a connected skill tree where you have to have a certain abilities to unlock others. Mm-hmm. Um, I did play with that idea, but ultimately I still felt like that may still follow possibly too linear of a path. I, I thought about it and um, ultimately uh, I'm, I'm not fully against it, but at the same time, I like the idea of it's more of um, abilities that you, that you can freely choose uh, that aren't necessarily tied to other abilities. That's also why uh, in in the document that I showed you is, is a perfect example of this, because like I said, that was the one that's the most fully uh, fleshed out. Um, a lot of abilities, at least I hope I... Oh, it looks like I might not have even done that right. Um, a lot of abilities actually have um, ranks to them. So if you gain a, a slot in, in let's say, like Tier 2, and you have uh, Blazing Spear, um, and you you like Blazing Spear, and you kind of want to like strengthen that, you can take your slot, and instead of getting a new power, you can put it into Blazing Spear to make it... Um, to make it stronger mm-hmm. um, that way th- that way if you want to you can have a more concentrated character who has very concentrated abilities or you can have a nice even spread where you have all these different uh, unique abilities um, kind of like a Swiss army knife in that regard um, if that's what you want to do um, so that was my way of kind of like addressing like skill tree in the w- way of like tears so or uh, in in the way that uh, of like having stronger abilities tied to ones previously without restricting or or limiting what's available in each tier for for a person to take on for their character Mm -hmm. now i had also seen that there is that there's hinting of a universal list yes yes so the all the all the types have that in their first tier um, towards the bottom. There is the uncanny development, which is what you're referring to, uh, where um, if for whatever reason you are playing a type and you want to try to go for something a little more on the generic side, um, then you can go to the universal list and take that as your as one of your your powers. Um, and this is this is. I say universal powers list. It is also fair to call it more like a generic power list. So this is this includes things like light, um, uh, like being able to uh, or super strength, being able to leap uh, tall bounds, as well as um, as well as abilities that didn't really fit into any other tier. And I wanted to give people the opportunity to explore that if that's something they wanted to do. Um, uh, one of the reasons that came about is because in the Q and A. People kept asking me pretty much the same question, but in different skins, which is, uh, how do I create Spider-Man? How do I create Green Lantern? How do I create Superman? How do I create this character? And I'm just, and it's kind of, my thought was what you mentioned earlier, just like, that's not really the the point is to like, it's not to play on already established characters to create your own. But I also understand the idea of like, I like this person. I want to create somebody that's like them in some regard, or at least play with their powers. So um, taking that that example of Spider-Man, like he has extremely unique abilities, you know, making a type that is like spider type, not only would be uh, weirdly specific, but also possibly encroaching on some, uh, some property violations. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so. I... I, I, I ended up creating a, a character for an old campaign called Arachnite because <laughs> the whole the whole idea was we we were all given a challenge that we had to basically make a amalgam style character. Mm-hmm. Uh, if are you familiar at all with the amal- with the amalgam universe experiment? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think I am. I think. Back in the '90s, there was a mar- there was the there was a big crossover that was based that was Marvel versus DC. Yes, and it the whole thing started with two deities that were per- apparently were the representatives of e- of their side's universe. Decided to have a bunch of characters from both sides get into a massive brawl. Yeah. At the end of it, they temporarily fused, and we end up getting a bunch of. <laughs> Amalgam Comics characters, which which were characters that were fusion that were doing the fusion dance between two between two <laughs> others. So yeah. you have 
So you have the Flash and Ghost Rider combining into Speed Demon. You have nice. <laughs> um, Batman and Wolverine combining into Dark Claw. You that have, one I do know, yeah. Um, Superman and Captain America becoming Super Soldier. Um, <laughs> you have Zatanna and Emma Frost. Com- not a- no, no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't Zatanna and Emma Frost. It was. It was. Um, Zatanna and Scarlet Witch becoming the White Witch. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up going with a uh, with um Arachnite, which was me trying to fuse the idea of um Shining Knight from Justice from Justice League mm. and um Spider Man. Nice. Um, especially since I I can't I. I can't remember where I found this, but there was a fa- there was this fan art I had s- seen years and years ago of someone um, designing Spider Man to look to look like a medieval knight. Oh yeah, and it ju- it just put the idea in my head. Plus, I plus I like wordplay. Right. So, no, I understand that completely. But no, even I, though there's yeah. the web even. Even though there's the web slinging, most mostly from hit, mostly from his sword, it is mm-hmm. legally distinct. <laughs> right, fair enough. Yeah, I um, I, I I didn't realize that that it was called that. I am familiar uh with what you're referring to as far as like that crossover event, um, as well as the because like I said, I remember the Wolverine and Batman one because I think it's claws or batterings, right? Which I looked at that and like somehow that looks more painful to like extract from your body than Wolverine's claws normally. That they're so barbed. Like, uh, that doesn't look con- that doesn't look comfortable for me. <laughs> um but um but yeah, the uh, the idea wa- for the universal uh list was so that um a lot of these generic or a lot of these like more unique or um out of place for for lack of a better term uh powers sets uh could still be utilized by somebody if they wanted to if they wanted to to try to create like their own spider-man like and the thing is too i i almost wouldn't have gone with it if i didn't remember that there are other characters across like multiple universes that are like him like for a great example is i think his name is the black spider from dc who was an assassin Mm-hmm. who was pretty much just spider-man if he was an assassin like legitimately fully all the way through it's just peter parker if you kill people um and i thought about that and i was like yeah i mean i can see why people would want to play that kind of character aside from just loving spider-man his powers are cool what web, web swinging uh extreme acrobatics that's really cool so that's why i i started throwing together the universal power list so that people uh can do that like um one of the things that came up in the Q&A of, like, how I would, again, create Spider-Man is, like, oh, I would probably do, like, maybe a gadgeteer um, t- uh, person, because I always loved the way Peter Parker has always been a techie uh, type of superhero, where he has, like, all these gadgets. Um, and uh, someone was like, oh, I would probably go for, like, a ninja or something more stealthy. Um, but, of course, like, throwing in, like, web throwing, or web slinging in one of those would just kind of be it would stand out and it wouldn't feel like it me- uh, meshed well with the other powers. And so um, ultimately I, I, I did that. So that way, if you wanted to create a black spider, Spider-Man, a rack knight type character, uh, you could choose one of these archetypes for your general power sets. And then if you wanted to have that added uh, bonus to make your character look maybe a little more unique or give them a little bit more uh, of a generic power, again, flight, super strength, then you can go to the universal power and uh, or the uncanny development and um, inherit that that trait for your your specific character. Yep. Also, yeah. I am I have been ma- I am I am very much aware that a, that a, that uh, Marvel did use did use the name Arachnite. Um, <laughs> Did they really? for, a, for this we, for this fusion of um of Spider Man and Moon Knight. Oh. I did not know that they called it that. I remember seeing a picture of that. I didn't know it was actually called the Iraq Knight. Huh. And uh, but uh but um I That's all I have thing. to say all I have to say on the matter is is mixing mixing um Spider Man with Moon Knight to create this kind of thing. Um, kind of, kind of a, kind of a waste there. Yeah. Um, 
but I will I will admit part of the part of the reason that I that I that I asked about I asked about universal powers and the like is mm -hmm. um some of the characters that I, some of the characters that I've made are very difficult to ru to run in, to run in some games um mm -hmm. especially especially one especially one of them who is an ice manipulator but uses that ice to make wep to make weapons and the problem mm. is a lot if you try and do if you try and do the whole ice manipulator in a lot of supers games it's assuming you're going to be a blaster right which not the case here right and to the to that to that end since there is a leveling system i'm assuming you're going with 20 levels or are you going um lower no it is 20 levels yeah right. now something something else i wa i was um i was a, i was a bit i was a bit curious about mm -hmm. is um is what exactly expertise and tra and traits entail um, so expertise is uh, essentially like your proficiency, uh, things that you are notably skilled in and you would have a bonus uh, when utilizing them, uh, such as specific weapons. Uh, if you remember, it, uh, along with Uncanny Development, one of the other things that shows up in all the uh, types is weapon training. So if you're a character, if for whatever reason you you take on, let's say, like a a... I, an ice type character in, in this game called a cryo if you take on a cryo and you're like well i want my cryo to have like a freaking uh maul as a weapon you know because that that's just what i what i think of for my character then you absolutely can take on like the weapon training and take that that weapon as your uh or, and, and become skilled in it so that way when you're using it in combat you have that bonus to your to your attack yeah hmm um, since you mentioned you mentioned it being analogous to proficiency, but unless I'm mistaken, I don't see any anything that would imply a universal development when it comes to expertise. Um, and you mean in regards to like just growing as a character and just gaining expertise and things, or what do you mean? Uh, uh -huh. What I what I mean by that is you look at you is how. In the in the world's most litigious role playing game, you have a you ha you have it you have that gradual bonus um, of um, mm. pro of in that case proficiency as mm -hmm. you de as you develop and right. I'm not I'm not seeing anything like that here unless you unless you plan on doing a um, half level kind kind of thing. So um, my plan was I, I do have it listed in another part uh, in the actual like main rules um the the plan for that is when you are uh skilled in uh, a weapon or in a particular ability or a tool set um you add a you roll a d6 and add the results to your uh your actual like d20 roll mm -hmm. um to determine uh what sort of boost um, that kind of adds a little bit of risk uh, to the to the scenario, which I was one of the things I think is great about TTRPGs personally. Uh, who doesn't like to gamble, right? Um, but um, but especially when you're not losing money, exactly. But I think that like it's it's moments like those where where rolling to see if you if you can just just make that um, that number that you need. Uh, is is there's something so gratifying when that when that number hits the table and you jump up and you're just like yes and you're able to like lift the car off of you and save your aunt may you know what i mean um so so that's why with the skilled uh, it is mentioned in another part of the rule book i didn't include in the document i sent you but um that you uh when you are skilled in, in something and you want to use that and you're making like a skill check or you're making an attack roll uh you would roll a d6 and add that results to your um to your initial role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, just out of, just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. it in the description of Pyro, it mentioned it mentioned um, subtypes, which yes. I can I can I can kind of get what it's doing. But do you have plans where sub where subtypes um, affect, can affect development beyond first level, or 
Is it strictly a first level affair? Oh, so uh, I probably should clarify that then, uh, because subtypes actually affect your character uh, throughout as as a whole. So uh, in the example of the pyro, uh, when you take on a subtype, you um, you gain that ability, uh, the the perks of that subtype uh, when utilizing your ability. So an example is uh, the fire dancer. How not only does it uh, it allows you to choose. Uh, let me see. Make sure I wrote that right. Yeah, you can choose up to five people to be unaffected by your flames because a lot of the powers in the Pyro's types are fairly are, are very destructive. Like it is a very destructive power set and the power expression. So um, it's one of those things of like, hey, get out the way. The flamethrower is here. Um, with the Fire Dancer, though, like you have that ability that with any of your Pyro abilities, um, you are able to control the flames so you don't burn your your teammates if you wish if you don't want to. Mm. Um, Versus like the soul fire one where um, instead of dealing like fire damage, you're actually dealing like necro damage, which is in this case is like necrotic or dark, uh, dark damage. Um, so you're um, you're essentially burning at the person's soul. Mm -hmm. And it's that's to kind of lean more into like the ghost rider supernatural element of it. But um, but it's not something that is only like a first level thing per se. It's when you create your character and you choose your subtype uh you choose or you uh, you choose your type you decide what subtype your character falls into and that uh kind of helps um inform not inf uh, i guess not inf i don't want to say inform like the way your abilities look per se um although that is the case for some of the types but it is like it adds an a, an extra element mm -hmm. to how your powers work uh, a better example honestly and one of my favorite ones is the geo subtypes which are um mountain volcano um ferrite and sable which uh mountain is you know you lean into the like the pure uh, solidity of the of the geo uh, geokinesis but like volcano you add fire damage to your to your geokinetic abilities and anyone who touches your constructs takes fire damage and uh with sable like you are master of sand and all your construct your stuff is made of sandstone and you have um a boost to like being able to dodge people you're a little bit more uh agile and then ferrite is just uh straight up like magnetokinesis so that is you controlling metals uh with your mind rather than just regular dirt or stone um so a lot of the types are like this is kind of to inform the way your powers look if you choose them to be a lot of them are just uh the way your control over your abilities uh manifest mm -hmm. yeah now the now um a lot of a lot of characters in superhero works mm -hmm. will tend to, will tend to have tend to have some kind of weakness in in some form some sort of some sort of balancing out mm -hmm. whether that be whether that be a physical object like say like say kryptonite whether that be um a a psycho a psychological thing like the like the fact that Moon Knight is an exact is suffers from dissociative um, dissociative yeah. identity disorder and has three per and has three personalities, mm -hmm. or what or whether it be some whether it be a weakness to the color to the color yellow, right? Um, <laughs> or or even or even or even the color timer in Ultraman. Yes, I'm counting that. Yes, I'm counting that as <laughs> stuff. Yeah, the three the three minute rule, as it were. Absolutely. Um, how would you have those kind of things reflected within Epic? So, um, one of the things I very much am looking forward to, and you you'll see on the character sheet as well, uh, listed on the second uh, half of it, um, there is listed like uh, under occupation, there are like strengths, weaknesses, and mantra. Um, weaknesses, I do want to focus on less of a 
less of a Pokemon rock, paper, scissors kind of weakness of like, oh, if you're this type, you're weak to this thing. I did initially think about that, but then I hated that. So I, I scrapped it. Instead, I wanted to lean into, I get, like you were mentioning, that weaknesses come in a lot of different forms, ranging from, like you said, the color, even something as seemingly ridiculous as the color yellow, or how Wonder Woman used to be weak to uh, what being bound by a man, which is just abs- absurd. Um, or Martian Manhunter being weak to fire. Um, or again, even like psychological things, like you mentioned with, with Moon Knight uh, having that split personality disorder, or um, I'm, I'm forgetting who it is, but I know that there is a superhero who's like who's claustrophobic. Um, so I wanted the ability for the char- uh, for the player to have a weakness for their character that they felt fit their character. Um, and this, granted, this is a little bit like leaning into you know like giving them a little bit more create uh a little bit more agency um and in some cases you're gonna have that guy most likely who will be like oh well my guy is weak to i don't know cotton balls so you know so that way it's not something that they think will will come up uh and then that's when you have dms like me who will absolutely make a, a villain whose entire thing is uh cotton balls and they're the cotton bunny uh and will absolutely destroy that character but <clears throat> that's regardless the point is um i did want to lean into the idea that weaknesses um can be something physical but they can also be uh psychological or personal and the weakness is whatever you choose it to be for your character and in instances where a weakness is taken advantage of that's that's really up to the author who uh which is what i'm calling the the gm in this case mm-hmm. uh, of how to utilize it and how it truly affects the person whether it deals like actual damage to them or if it just hinders them uh, to the point where they're on they have like uh they roll against the odds and certain things um it's it's ultimately more of a narrative tool because i think that is in comics, what they are, um, even though sometimes they're used as like MacGuffins or ways to like, you know, Superman is pretty much impervious to everything except for Kryptonite. So we just throw Kryptonite in there, anything that Lex Luthor is in. Sure. Or you can also utilize them in uh, again, in like narrative ways of, you know, oh, I'm I'm I have this trauma or I have this thing that um, whenever whenever I'm around, I'm out in the sun, like I feel weaker you know, for whatever reason. One, Not, per, one particular, yeah. one particular weakness that that I've that I've, that I've seen in Togusats that I I find interesting is in the series Garo. Okay. Where Garo is a which for, for the record is re, is really good. Garo is a hor, is a horror leaning Togusats series, um, mm-hmm. involving involving a a, gr- a group of monster hunters known as Makai Knights. Hmm. Uh, the strongest wep- the strongest weapon they have in their arsenal is is their armor which they which they can call which they can call upon but there's a there's a catch mm-hmm. the armor can on- because of the metal that it's made out of the armor can only be maintained f- safely for 99.9 seconds you Technically, can wear it for longer than that, but you run the risk of becoming what's known as a lost beast. Gotcha. Basically, you turn basically you turn into a monster. Yeah. Uh, now obviously, I wouldn't I wouldn't put a turn count on this on this kind of thing, but <laughs> uh, I am cur- I am curious how you, if somebody wanted to do that kind of timer sor- sort of weakness, how would you handle that kind of thing? Mm. Um. Yeah, um, I haven't thought about writing specific rules for that, but that's definitely something interesting that I could I could include uh, because it's it's true that like with direct exposure to your weakness, like there's likely some, going to be some sort of detrimental effect to that, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so it will it would likely be something along the lines of um, with repeated exposure or with uh, consistent ex- exposure, then you uh, suffer from um, like a specific status effect or uh, you roll against the odds uh, for like the next minute or so. 
um, until you are away from your weakness for, for a certain amount of time, or you've had like a long, uh, or finished a full rest or something like that. Um, that's definitely something to think about. Um, and I like the idea of utilizing that uh, as like to make the weaknesses more mechanical, because that's kind of what I wanted to do with this game ultimately was to f to marry like strong strong narrative with mechanics that make sense and are you know are actually fun to to operate with um so that is something i will i'll definitely keep in mind and probably put in the game mm -hmm. so and speak speaking of speaking of that um mm -hmm. one per there's there, one particular um there's two particular archetypes that always come to mind when it comes to ones that are tricky to implement with the power systems that you often see in mm -hmm. Super's games. One of them is the is the is the um, equipment hero. Your your Iron Man, your your Night Thrasher, your Blue Beetle. Basically, somebody who gets their abilities through a certain type of equipment. It doesn't even have right. to be tech. It doesn't even have to be tech based either. Mm -hmm. um, either. Um, I may as well throw in Exo Man of War, though that's a deep cut. <laughs> done by done by pe done by people who had worked on Iron Man in the past, so full right. circle. <laughs> the other one, as mentioned before, is uh, magic, because with the way a lot of magic at um, powers are done in uh, most supers games, you there's no limit to what you can to what you can do. Mm -hmm. Because it's because it's essentially like a Joker card, right? So, I'm curious how you would handle how you would handle those. Are would those be types? Um. So yes, there are a couple of types that fall into what you would call probably like more of a, an equipment based one. Uh, and to name the specific ones, there's Archer, Blade, Gunner, mm -hmm. um, and Gadgeteer, where they, uh, as as they sound, you know, that's swordsmen, uh, people who utilize firearms, people who utilize um, bows and arrows and crossbows, and then people who utilize, like, advanced technology like Batman, or again, Spider-Man, in my view. Um, but uh, it, it's kind of, it's split. Uh, in the same way that magic uh, in this game is, is split. Um, there are types where, uh, if you wanted to play somebody who was very focused or heavy into a specific, uh, like gadgeteer or, or weapon, uh, expression, um, then you can lean into that and you could still have, like you said, more, a less techie and more supernatural origin to it or where, um, like Iron Man very clearly is like a tech based hero. And you could argue Blue Beetle is too, but uh, he also falls under a unique category where it's not something that he created. It's not something that is like, it's just using utilizing his smarts the same way that Tony Stark does. It's an alien thing that attached itself to, to Jaime's back mm -hmm. and is now like speaking to him. So um, he would fall into um, one of the origin, uh, one of the origins, which is essentially replacing race in this game um, of the host, which is one of my personal favorites where you have some sort of uh, extraterrestrial or supernatural entity that has made its uh, made you its host and you tap into its abilities to to uh, to do your superhero stuff a, a very the best example of this and the, the inspiration for this was venom where you know Eddie Brock very obviously is a host to a paras or a symbiotic creature who like without it he's just Eddie Brock um, but with it, you know, he is the the lethal protector. Um, so the, it it gives the what's available here allows you to um, kind of find your way to the type of character that you really want to play as, whether or not you want to play a like a genius tech uh, junkie like Tony Stark. Um, or even Bruce Wayne, or if you want to do something where it's like it's something that my character my character doesn't really fully understand, but they they know that they want to use this power to do good, and so they're going to, you know, they're going to willingly use uh, allow themselves to be a host, or they're going to um, embrace this thing that they don't fully get uh, in order to try to help people. Um, so that way, like the techie type people are are split. Um, but for people who want to utilize weaponry, there are, again, the types of, um, like, Blade, Gunner, and Archer. Mm -hmm. um, one of the universal powers I should also mention, because I can't 
I can't ignore inspirations for this. Obviously, it's a superhero thing, and I love superheroes, so I'm going to be drawing from my from source material. So one of the universal powers is um, something called Only the Worthy, which you might be able to guess what that is inspired from, but the idea <laughs> is you, are, you have a weapon uh, that you have essentially established a deeper uh, spiritual like connection with, whether it's like there's a soul placed in it, like Katana from DC, or it's something that is tied to you mystically, like Thor, uh, where you're the only person that can wield it. You um, you are skilled with it, or you gain like a boost with it, um, and you can summon it to your side whenever you want. So if you want to play a character like that, then you have that option um, while still playing like any other type. But if you want to be somebody who's like, no, my person is a lethal assassin, they utilize, uh, they're like, they're an expert swordsman, they're one of the best, then you can absolutely play a blade and you can still take on only the worthy. Because that honestly seems like a fun thought in my head of somebody who has you know like a supernatural sword and that they mastered that sword and now they are you know they're um the slicer or something like that you know what i mean mm -hmm. so um so that's to answer the the equipment based stuff is like that is there are definitely different ways to pursue options without being funneled into a specific expression or, or something like that um mm -hmm. there are different ways to, to do that as for magic so magic is as you know a very complicated topic um you have a lot of popular TTRPGs that are set in fantasy, which are a little bit easier to explain magic and explain where its place lies in their world. In a superhero world, magic is alongside like super science and alongside like uh, being a metahuman and alongside being an alien. Like it's it's not something that's. Am I back? There we go. Yeah. Um, it stands out as this. Um, it in, in fantasy, it is it, its own thing that permeates through all facets of life, um, no, uh, to to various degrees. Whereas in this, it's it's kind of its own separate thing that shines as it should, but it is not present in everything in the same way that it is in like D and D Pathfinder and whatnot. Um, the way magic is handled. Um, I also, I have a problem, and I've always had a problem with the idea that magic is a special MacGuffin that can just work your uh, work to fix whatever problem you have, and so it kind of lowers the stakes of any given situation, um, because that the idea that magic is does not follow rules is complete is a lie. That's not how magic ever works. If you follow most fiction, like magic usually has very specific rules that you have to follow. In comics, especially, you have rules. Like, look at Zatanna. She has to, she's only uh, limited to what she's capable of uh, conjuring using her own willpower and what she, of all the backward spells that she knows. <laughs> um, granted, a lot of them are like more mon seemingly mundane things, but like, it's still a rule in and of itself that you can't just like whim, whim something away with magic. Like there are limits to what you're capable of. Let's um, if to yeah. use another to use another example. Let's consider um, Doctor Strange. Yes. The sole reason that he the sole reason that he has his magical abilities is because he is because the Tribune allows him allows it to, allows allows that power to be given to him. Right. Um. And in some in some cases, it's because it's because of having cer having certain artifacts. But that's where you get into the different interpretations thing. Um, yeah. In in the in the case of of um Etrigan, well, <laughs> first first off, you have the reversal of the inversion of how possession usually works. It's not a yeah. demon possessing a man. It's a man possessing a demon. Mm -hmm. uh, second off, there's that rule that everything Etrigan says has to be in rhyme. Yeah, <laughs> which just is so delightful for me. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, exactly. The there are clear cut rules, uh, especially in the world of 
of comic books and superhero stories of like how magic is supposed to be used and sometimes it differs from person to person a lot of times it actually differs from person to person like you said etrigan has to has, has to speak in rhyme and the way his his ability to to manifest himself is very different in any way from how zatanna or dr fate work um there's so also the fact that when we when we look at the way mage the way a lot of magic characters work in fantasy fiction Mm. This idea, this idea that they're a narrative get out of jail free card doesn't quite work because that. Be, let's let's consider um. Let's let's consider let's consider the. I'll use one. I'll use a um anime that I'm fond of that leans into mm. fantasy. Um, Orphan. Okay. In order to util in order to utilize magic, mm -hmm. um. You have to be from a certain. You have to be from a certain bloodline. That bloodline being from the Celestials who interbred with with humans. If you're mm -hmm. not a part of that bloodline, you don't get magic. Right. And yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying, yeah, and which is very, very much like how in uh, in Tolkien's work, like magic is reserved for for the Mayar. Like you can't just you can't just be a wizard in Lord of the Rings unless you are a celestial being sent by the gods. You know what I mean? So it is it is a very or specific or tied thing. there or tied thereof by by blood by bloodline. Right. Um, just, Aragorn with Aragorn being able to do the equivalent of lay on hands made him it was was seen as a, was is enough to make him king. Um, right. And of course, don't even get me started on all the magic systems that Sanderson has in all of his work. <laughs> not that's not that's not a knock on him. I want whatever drugs he's on. <laughs> fully fair, fully fair. And yeah, I'm a fan of Dark Souls, and there, mm -hmm. there's you have you have multiple forms of magic that are drawn that are drawn upon eat, and that is reflected in the kind of kit that you have access to. And mm -hmm. the way that that kit works, somebody who, um, the big the big thing the big matter is the is the fact that you're either get you're either going to be doing miracles or doing sorcery, mm -hmm. and those are going to require two different stats, right? And thus two and thus two different builds because of how Dark Souls works. But the point is is that is this idea that ma that magic is this is this get out of jail free card you only. You only re you only really see in more traditionalist minded um, games, mm -hmm. and in fiction it it can be present, but not as much as people think. Right. Yeah, and even like in in established uh, RPGs that are already out there, um, like there even then there are rules. Like there are spell slots in D and D, or there are like there are components that you need to use, or you need to be able to to do certain things to be able to use certain magic. So the idea that like oh you can just like cast a spell and fix everything is like oh no, I still need a yeah. diamond because our that's the only way I'm gonna be able to revive our friend. You are know you <laughs> Are you familiar with Warhammer Fantasy? I am, yes. So you, so you know about <laughs> how the winds of magic work, and that um, yes, messing yes. with magic in that in that is like messing with barely stable nu um, nuclear material. Absolutely, yes. Oh my gosh! Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so um, that's why, like in in Epic, it's not. It's definitely not that same. Like get out of jail. I, the way I utilize it in a way to kind of help separate it from the other types, um, there are there is the sorcerer uh, type that um, has I don't want to say vaguer abilities because that's that's not true. There are things that like allow you to cast spells to to summon like uh, projections to be able to defeat your enemy or to be able to summon like sigils to. Uh, to ward off against certain evils, but there are certain things that are in place for you to be able to 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 work creatively with magic while still being within certain limitations of like I can only do this spell. You know, I like I can I only have so many uh, so many spells and abilities that I have under my belt, um, and it allows a player to to try to think a little bit more creatively about how to utilize that spell. 
Um, and they're not just straightforward damage dealing things like pyro or or even gunner or anything like that. Um, and like I said, magic is also split into two different things. There's magic, which is your type uh, of sorcerer. Uh, actually, sorcerer, celestial, and dark wizard kind of all fall into that uh, so, like super category of magic type uh, characters, but. Um, but there's also your origin can be uh, mystic, which um, if let's say you wanted to be a, uh, excuse me, let's say that you wanted to be a gadgeteer, but you didn't want to just be like a Tony Stark. You didn't want to be uh, like just somebody who throws like smoke grenades, you know, because they're super smart. You might be a technomancer. And so you have your origin as the mystic, where the reason you have your abilities is because you have tapped into like the mystic arts and you've studied the supernatural. And so, um, or, or even just like you've awakened some arcane ability within yourself that allows you to utilize the powers from your chosen, your chosen class. So magic uh, operates uh, in that way too, of being a flavor element, uh, as or also a mechanical one, but a flavor element for uh, with your origin. If you didn't want to just be like a Doctor Strange type, but you wanted to be like a a magical Human Torch, um, while also still being a type, if you wanted to play as a sorcerer, and I also love the idea too of pl playing a sorcerer who isn't actually magical. Uh, a great example, and one I use uh, a lot too, is um, it's actually a super villain of um, uh, of Abracadabra from dc who objectively does not have magic but he uses super science to imitate magic and um so he he would fall into the sub uh, into the type of sorcerer but he would most likely have more of like uh the techie origin so um so that's the, in that way magic is split um, but to ultimately, again, answer your question about like how magic works and how to keep it from being this magical get out of jail free card, um, it is more of a tool in the toolbox, but it's definitely not your sonic screwdriver. And even the, even the sonic screwdriver has its limits. It doesn't work on wood. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, now... With that, in, with that in mind, one particular issue that can happen, especially in long-term campaigns, is mm -hmm. meaning, maintaining a certain tier. Like if you're, if uh, as you level, as you level up or gain or gain experience that you're going to spend, regard depending on the game, mm -hmm. it can be difficult to maintain, say, street level if your character is meant, if your character is meant to be street level across that amount of time. Is yeah. that something that you guys have? taken into consideration when it comes to epic so that if your character is meant to be on the same street level tier as say the heroes for hire you don't mm -hmm. all of a sudden start taking on national or even world level threats absolutely yeah so one of the <laughs> i don't want to, to sound like i'm uh quoting off of like the back of a comic book when i say this but um there's the common phrase of like Evil doesn't take a rest, right? So, in that way, uh, your antagonists will often try to find a way to overcome you and get stronger themselves. And so, uh, even if you are a street level person like Heroes for Hire uh, or the Defenders or anything like that, uh, and you don't want to be like a global threat um, battling person, you absolutely still can, and you can still have that level of character advancement and and that escalation and challenge because um, as long as your author is doing it right and planning things correctly, you can still have a kingpin type character who is a street level villain, but absolutely uh, would like get stronger or gain more resources or have more people at their disposal to challenge you um, to fully combat against you or to um, pose a threat to you and your city. Mm. Um, yeah. So that's absolutely uh, something that is in place um, for, for this game. It's not, it, the, well, that's one of the things that kind of bothered me about uh, the Marvel uh, one that like I said, is, is coming. I think it's coming out this month. Um, that the way they set it up is your level is essentially your your superhero ranking, and and as 
it reflects your power. And so you start off as like a low level street level person and then you increase in rank until you're essentially a global uh, threat, global threat fighting person. And while that's great and all, because that means, you know, Luke Cage gets to play with the Avengers, you know, Luke Cage still wants to protect Harlem. He doesn't really, that's not his thing, that he's not there to fight Hydra over uh, overseas or try to take on Doctor Doom in Latveria. Like, his priorities is to take care of Harlem and to take care of the people that are trying to take advantage of the people in Harlem. So you absolutely can have a street level villain uh, or, or threat that escalates and grows with you in order to meet you as a challenge. Um, if you, like I said, as long as your, your author is doing it right, which, you know, um, I know that sounds like I'm putting a lot on the author, but so are a lot of other TPT RPGs mm -hmm. where they're just like, yeah, it's pretty much up to you to make the game challenging and fun for your players. So, yeah. And speaking of speaking of that, mm -hmm. do you have considering the considering the um, way characters are designed? Do you have plans on pu on putting in a a um a customizer for bestiary? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I haven't fully fleshed it up, but it's definitely something that's in the forefront of my mind. Um, I've compiled, like, several lists full of different kind of, uh, creatures and different opponents that you will, you would face, uh, in, throughout the game, or that, um, your author could pull from in order to create, like, your, your team of henchmen to go up against. Um, and, but there will absolutely be be things in place for you to um, tweak the the creatures a little bit, or even a lot, um, and make them stronger or weaker um, if you need to, in order to to make them fit appropriately in your your story. Yeah. Now, one other th one other thing I'm, I was curious about is if you had planned on putting it in. Mm -hmm. Some games will have, especially superhero games, will have some sort of extra effort system. Whether it be hero points, whether it be action points, whether it be edge, do you have something similar? Um, trying to so as far as like just putting in just uh, the, I guess like throwing it on the line and trying to uh, I I think I know what you're you're referring to, but I just want to make sure I I do understand of like. Possibly like po posing a personal risk to yourself so that you can try to be more like succeed. Yeah, it can, that's one form it can take, but it's basically mm -hmm. some sort of limited use effect that mm -hmm. can that can give that can give you can give you a boot can give you a boost to a particular role, but mm -hmm. it it either can only be used a certain amount of times or it imposes disadvantages. It depends on the game in question. Right. Um. I didn't initially plan for that, but after listening uh, to a couple, a couple other people explain uh, the way their systems utilize something similar, um, I have given it a lot of thought, and it's probably something I will absolutely include, because I like that idea of, like, I need to, like, the idea of someone being in a situation where I need to absolutely push myself to the absolute limit to try to succeed in this thing, because otherwise, like, people are going to die, or people uh, are going to be you know, the world may end or something like that. A uh, great example being um, in early Spider-Man comics when uh, Doc Ock's base is, like, crashing down on Peter and Aunt May, I think she needed, like, a transplant or she needed or something like that, and he needed to get to the hospital to save her. But he's crushed under the under a Doc Ock's fortress underwater, and all this water is pouring on top of him, and there's this epic moment of him just being, like, fully broken. Bones are broken. He's He's fully, like, thrashed. And he's just like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And finally, he's just like, no, but I need to do it. And he stands up and lifts the rubble off of himself in this great feat of strength. I love moments like that across all uh, sort of narrative type games, uh, because I think those are some of the greatest moments. Uh, a great example of this would be, even though this was still more of like a narrative thing more than anything, but um, in the Adventure Zone uh, actual play series, um, there is the moment that they refer to called Arms Outstretched, mm -hmm. which is when, like, they made a collective effort to pull one of their own from, like, spiritual death and pull them back into the land of, of the material plane. And it's it's moments like that where, you know, putting in that extra effort or having that moment where you're like, I'm, I need to be 
I need to be a superhero right now and do the, like push myself to this limit. Uh, it's something that I really, really like and I want to try to implement as a uh, narrative tool for people to utilize um, in the scenario where they feel like it's, you know, it's this or nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, there probably will be like a greater, uh, uh, like a high risk, high reward kind of situation where like um, you can do this, but it's going to be like detrimental or you may have like a lasting or sustained injury or something as a result of it. Yeah. But I mean, but you can still do this in order to secure a victory for yourself or just to make sure that you get done what needs to get done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, with all that said, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? For the for the book, so my initial plan was a little over two hundred, and that was when I had the more linear structure for the book. Um, when I redid it in this in the ability pool format, I realized that my my pages are looking at about ten pages per type uh, at the very least, uh, and that's just for the type descriptions. So I'm looking probably closer to 300 uh pages for this book which is definitely uh, a lot more than i ever anticipated but at the same time i i love working on this project and i i mean i feel like the more i add to it the more it gives people um to use um because one of the things that i wanted to focus on uh, like i mentioned earlier was marrying a narrative and um mechanics uh, m- marrying the the narrative sto- storytelling with the dice rolling and kind of make it finding a nice little balance in the middle and the p- towards the narrative point like i really wanted to give players as much agency as they as they deserve because and that's why i was steered away from the linear structure because i didn't give them enough agency that's why i decided to to utilize uh the different origins that are separate from the types and how they can get their powers and uh, creating the ability pools because i wanted the players to be able to have as much agency as um as they can, honestly, because that is where you get the most satisfaction out of your creative character and playing your character's story. Um, so I almost lost. Uh, so to that, like, even even if it does mean I'm going to like 300 pages, like the more I include, I like to believe is giving more and more agency to the players to create their ideal. Uh, character scenario backstory all that stuff so they can have the most fun um because ultimately you know that's kind of the point of creating these games is that people have fun so Mm -hmm. now with with all that said i will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops Mm. and thank you and i hope and as and once again once, as I often say, I often say to folks, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to you for taking the time out of your schedule and juggling time zones as well as me getting stuck <laughs> in traffic to mm-hmm. come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Absolutely, and... yeah. No, thank you so much for inviting me on. This has been super fun, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, it's always good to talk shop with people and talk about comic books, honestly, because you know people. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that can be kind of polarizing for some people. They're like, well, actually, and uh, if you look back on, on this like series, uh, or if you look back on the, on the Frank Miller era, like this, th- that, that character was completely different. Um, but it's always fun to talk about superhero superpowers, because I think there is a beauty in, in the, the, the genre of like, these are people, it's not just like people being punchy, punchy, smashy, smashy, you know, it's not about a guy who hits harder than the than the other guy. It a lot of the times it's about like having that inspiration, having somebody that you can look up to and emblemize. Like that's why I love Captain America so much is because he's somebody that I um, oftentimes want to be more like because he's a compassionate, sympathetic person, and he does what he does because he cares about other people. Uh, and he he works to protect other people, and um, and I think that is the beauty of the genre. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and that's why I love talking about them, uh, about superheroes and super things so much with people, is because I like to see the the things that they they idolize or that they they think is worth emblem. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, and and that they are they're passionate about um, through this through this genre that can can be very it's it's not very specific. You know, it can have fantasy elements. It can have sci-fi elements. Sometimes it's a merging of the two, and sometimes it's nothing, nothing like that. Um, but it is, it is the thing that unifies the genre, and the thing that makes it its own thing is the fact that it is about people who are meant to, who are trying to make a difference, and how we look at them and we want to mirror them. And um, I really hope that when people play this game, uh, I don't want to make it seem like, oh, this is a a message or something but like i really hope when people play this game like they kind of lean into that like almost childlike wonder of of reading their favorite comic stories and thinking about these characters and uh creating a character that they that they love and they would want to see on uh on pages as well um as their favorites so yeah well anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, <laughs> on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> awesome. <laughs>